I'm President Ulysses S. Grant, and I welcome you this day here in my study with me as I reflect on an interesting character and provocative character person in my life, Major General Henry Wager Halleck. General Halleck was born in January, January the 16th of 1815. He was one of uh, 14 children. He was the third born of 14 children up in Oneida County, New York, in Westernville, and uh, early on grew to detest farming and ran away. Didn't run far. He ran to an uncle's house in Utica, and where he was seeking uh, an education, and he got one indeed. He, he early on demonstrated that he was a precocious child. He uh, went to the Hudson Academy and then got a, a Bachelor of Arts degree from Union College and then went to the United States Military Academy, where he did a number of things. He caught the attention of uh, Dennis Mahon, who became very enamored of him and his abilities. In fact, had him teaching classes while he was still a cadet. He graduated third in his class of 31 in 1839. So he was there his last year while I was there for my first year in 1839-40. He was commissioned a second lieutenant in engineers and promptly went to work working with and designing building fortifications around the harbor of New York City and other installations in the area. He was then sent to, uh, he, he was, his work was impressive and General Scott, Winfield Scott, sent him to Europe uh, because he had written a treatise on the defenses, United States Army defenses, that the Senate published as an official uh, congressional document. Scott rewarded him, sent him to Europe in 1844 to study European fortifications, and particularly French fortifications, and he became conversant in French. He uh, came back from that trip after a year or so, and uh, delivered a series of 12 lectures to, at Lowell Hall uh, and uh, then published them in a book uh, called The Military Elements of Military Art and Science, which is lauded as, if not the first, one of the first books codifying military science. And he began to gain uh, the, the nickname Old Brains, which later became a sarcastic term, but more about that in a bit. He had uh, uh, been sent to California in the Mexican War in 1844, or 46 rather, and on the seven-month cruise around the Horn aboard the USS Lexington, he translated from French into English, the treatise uh, by Henri Omine, Omini, I never pronounced that correctly, uh, the uh, military and political treatise du Napoleon, or some such as that. And he further solidified his reputation as old brains. He got to California, he was in Southern California working under uh, various commanders, but he was working under General Bennett Riley. Uh, and actually in November of 47, saw combat. He actually saw combat in the seizure and the capture of Mazatlan and was actually Lieutenant Governor of that uh, city for a while. Uh, General Riley, for whom Port Riley, Kansas was named, saw his potential and had him working with the civilians in California and uh, working on their statehood as well. And uh, he helped and played a large role, in fact. Some people credit him with writing by himself the Constitution for the state of California. And uh, 
when California was deciding uh, on the two individuals to send to Washington City to represent them as their senators, his name was on the list. Now, either fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your point of view, I expect, uh, he came in third in the voting. So Henry Halleck did not go to Washington as a senator from California. He uh, then resigned. Well, he also began reading law, and he became an attorney on top of being an engineer. He resigned from the Army in 1854 and formed the law firm of Halleck, Peachy, and uh, who was that third individual? I don't recall, but he formed a three-way partnership and became one of the most successful law firms in California. He also began uh, investing in real estate and became a land developer. He was the president uh, of, he was the director of the uh, Almaden Quicksilver Company. He owned, bought and owned Rancho Nicasio, which was 30,000 acres. Oh, and his, his law firm was Halleck, Peachy, and Billings. He uh, also became the major general or a major general in the California militia. So even though he had resigned his commission in the army, he kept his military connection. Uh, we all knew it was coming. Sooner or later, the war in all probability was inevitable. So he maintained his military connection, major general of the California militia. He married in 1855, he married Elizabeth Hamilton, who was the granddaughter of Alexander Hamilton, which further well connected him. When the war started, he uh, came back to Washington City, and uh, General Scott, who thought very highly of him, made on his recommendation, and indeed his urging to President Lincoln, he was named uh, Major General regular army and then uh became what well, when he well, be, got that rank he was the fourth ranking officer in the united states army behind scott himself and uh fremont and i can't recall the other one but he was the fourth ranking officer in the United States Army in 61. Then he became commander. He re, In November, he replaced Fremont as commander of the Department of Missouri. And then he became commander of, of the Department of Mississippi. He uh, came down to uh, Mississippi after the Battle of Shiloh, and there had already been previous plans of some sort for him to come down there. But after the, the horror that was Shiloh, he came down and took his only field command in the war, which was not a good thing for him, as it turned out, because he, he demonstrated clearly his ineptitude of commanding an army in the field. He was an excellent administrator, superb uh, organizer, but he was not a combat officer. He uh, was not a str strategist at all, and not much of a tactician. That inexorable crawl toward Corinth from Shiloh took 30 days to go 20 miles. He went about three-fourths of a mile a day. He would uh, dig in, fortify, and move the next day. But I've got some quotations and observations to illuminate that better in a bit. In July of 62, he was uh, named General-in-Chief by President Lincoln, who was simultaneously exasperated and outdone with everyone prior to him naming uh, Halleck to be General-in-Chief, and also uh, in response to Halleck's very loud, 
self-promotion to get that rank. And Halleck served as general-in-chief from July of 62 until I became general-in-chief in March of 64. And President Lincoln was extremely unhappy with him because after he became general-in-chief, particularly with the Second Battle of Bull Run, he was trying to get McClellan to reinforce Pope, and he never could get McClellan to move. Of course, he was not alone in that, but in that effort and failure thereof. But McClellan did not reinforce Pope, and the Second Battle of Bull Run was a repeat of the First Battle of Bull Run, a debacle. And Halleck, after that, uh, he lost President Lincoln's confidence. President Lincoln said after that he, he would not make a decision. And Halleck was not uh, one to directly command. He, he liked to work behind the scenes, uh, which I found out to my chagrin after the war and after his death in 72. But uh, he didn't like to give orders himself directly. He didn't care much for the interpersonal contact. Except, in my experience, he apparently relished the interpersonal contact he had with me because he gave me such a bad time and spoke so harshly to me, which I have not forgotten. He uh, had to step down to become the, uh, my chief of staff after I took office and uh, was, d did that in an excellent manner and kept our armies all supplied, well supplied, in a timely manner. He was very good at that administrative position. After the war, uh, he had, he'd angered so many people that he was sent out in 65, I think August of 65, to be the commander of the Army of the, uh, Department of the Pacific, which really was being banished from the kingdom. Uh, he was put well outside the palace gates. And then in uh, 69, when I took office, he was uh, called back to become the commander of the Department of the South. And that was in Louis, headquartered in Louisville, Kentucky. And he was there from 69, uh, spring, summer of 69 to January of 72, where he developed, he became seriously ill and died. He, he uh, up and died, as they said in Louisville. He got carried off, and he died on January the 9th, just seven days short of his, I think, 58th birthday. He was born January the 16th of 1815, and he died January the 9th of 1872. Uh, and it was after that that I found out uh, some of the skullduggery that General Halleck had uh, perpetrated uh, for me, against me, about me, and tried uh, desperately to court-martial me. And uh, I found all of this out after his death. Uh, and I had, uh, particularly the first half of the war, uh, labored under misapprehension that he was my advocate. I knew somebody didn't like me above me, but uh, he had assured me there are no enemies between you and myself, and I took him at his word. And I, but I found out he his word was not to be believed. But I think to sum up General Halleck, I'd like to read you uh, some quotes of other individuals who knew Halleck and worked with him. So rather than just uh, take my statements at face value, uh, I submit these statements for your consideration about Major General Henry Wedger Halleck. President Lincoln said he was little more than a first-rate clerk because after the battle of Second Bull Run, uh, President Lincoln was extremely exasperated with him and he said he won't make a decision. He was very keen not to be blamed for anything. And after that debacle that was Second Bull Run, he wouldn't make a decision unless the president forced him. Gideon Wells, the Secretary of the Navy, 
said about General Halleck, he originates nothing, anticipates nothing, takes no responsibility, plans nothing, suggests nothing, and is good for nothing. Lou Wallace is one of those men that uh, Halleck had said, told him McClellan early in the war, the president appointing men like Nathaniel Banks, Ben Butler, Lou Wallace, Franz Siegel, and even McClellan was little less than murder because of the ineptitude of those men in command, and men died from that ineptitude. Well, Lou Wallace wrote about him. Uh, with 120,000 men, he was moving against 50,000 in the it's lamented to be the siege of Corinth, that 30-day uh, march for the 20 miles from Shiloh to Corinth. But he was moving against 50,000, whose recent defeats more than neutralized their advantage of fortifications. He was moving at the rate of a mile a day, throwing up works at every halt. That is, he gained a mile every day to go into besiegement every night. At the end, he would have spent a month doing what General Johnston had done in three days, beginning his approaches 20 miles from the town and confining them entirely to one side. He left the enemy free to choose which of the other three sides it would be best to retire by when the time came. And what all to take away with him. Finally, he placed his armies, all three of them, under a peremptory order not to bring on an engagement. It is better, he instructed them, to retreat than to fight. That's one of the men that Halleck said was little better than murder to appoint to a general command. The New York Times, even journalists got into it, the Grand Army, in speaking about the siege of Corinth, the Grand Army was like a huge serpent, large enough to eat up Beauregard at a single bite, one mouthful. But Halleck crept forward at the rate of about three quarters of a mile per day. Thousands and thousands of his men died from fevers and diarrhea. There was great dissatisfaction. Pope, who was particularly impatient, and General Palmer, who commanded on the front, reported that he could hold it against the world, the flesh and the devil. But Halleck telegraphed to Pope three times within an hour not to be drawn into a general engagement. Now, the author, George Gorham, who wrote The Life and Public Services of Edward M. Stanton, says this about General Halleck. When we consider the vast expenditure of time, lives, and money made during the ensuing year to ensure the capture of Vicksburg, that the whole year could probably have been saved and the position taken in July of 1862 instead of July 1863, if Halleck would have but extended his hand, his failure to do so seems unaccountable and unpardonable. And I should like to point out that General Halleck did not approve of my plan to go to Vicksburg, did not want to do it the way I did it, and was oppositional. George McClellan said, of all the men who I have encountered in high position, Halleck was the most hopelessly stupid. It was more difficult to get an idea through his head than can be conceived by anyone who never made the attempt. I do not think he ever had a correct military idea from beginning to end. He goes on to say, a day before or two before Halleck arrived in Washington, Stanton came to caution me against trusting Halleck, who was, he said, now this is the Secretary of War saying this about Halleck, 
probably the greatest scoundrel and most barefaced villain in America. He said that he was totally destitute of principle and that in the Almond and Quicksilver case, he had convicted Halleck of perjury in open court. When Halleck arrived, he came to caution me against Stanton, repeated almost precisely the same words Stanton had employed. But I should like to point out as well uh, that General McClellan also called Lincoln the original guerrilla, and he said that General Lee was likely to be timid and irresolute in action. But I believe, in conclusion with quotations, that Ben Butler, another one of the generals, political generals that President Lincoln appointed, uh, and that uh, Halleck specifically stated his appointment to being a general was little more than murder, uh, Ben Butler said this about General Halleck, I have since learned his character, which as I always speak plainly, I find to be that of a lying, treacherous, hypocritical scoundrel with no moral sense. Those are the observations that contemporaries of General Halleck had. And I found out after the fact that General Halleck was no friend of mine. And uh, that chagrins me greatly. But as I've said, I didn't find out about that treachery on his part toward my career until after he was gone. He died, as I have said, January the 9th, 1872, in Louisville, Kentucky, and was buried in Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn, New York. And if you're ever in Brooklyn and near the cemetery, perhaps you should stop by and pay your respects to General Halleck. Uh, his wife, his widow, Elizabeth Hamilton in 1875 married Colonel George Washington Cullum, uh, who uh, had a very distinguished career. And General Halleck also died leaving Mrs. Halleck an estate of a half million dollars at the time of his death. So that is quite enough for me to say at this time. Those are my reflections on another peripheral person in my life, General Henry Wager Halleck. Until the next time that we come together here in the library or wherever we may be, and I reflect again, I welcome you, I thank you for coming, and I bid you an affectionate farewell.